Welcome to Novara Live. As it's a Friday evening, I'll be joined later on by Aaron Bastani. And we have a very wide-ranging show for you this evening. We'll be talking about the fallout from Rachel Reeves's budget, some scare stories about market panic. Um, on a sort of more, I suppose, a story we don't talk too much about, geoengineering, something I'm interested in, quite controversial. Tech billionaires um, are investing in it and trying to block out the sun. Uh, potentially worrying, uh, but I think some interesting uh, sort of things to talk about on that topic. I speak to an expert um, and I will close the show, of course, by speaking about the latest from the US elections at the end of the last full week before they take place. The death toll from the floods in Spain this week have risen to 205 people and that figure is expected to rise in the coming days. The majority of those who have been killed were in the region of Valencia, where on Tuesday nearly a year's worth of rain fell in just eight hours. Um, climate scientists have been very, very clear these explosive downpours were intensified by climate change. In the immediate term, though, the focus is on the cleanup operation and the rescue operation. The BBC had this report this morning. Rescue teams are still searching for missing people. People have been lifted to safety from houses. Other teams have the grim task of recovering dead bodies. Officials here say dozens of people remain unaccounted for and that it's not possible to assess the full impact of the flooding. Homes, businesses and shops have been destroyed. Volunteers have arrived to help with the cleanup. The scale of the flooding is huge. These satellite pictures show Valencia a few weeks ago and what it looks like now. Survivors have told us how they felt abandoned by the authorities. I'm sorry, it's just helplessness, it's impotence. The government, they don't do anything. Every four years or two years, I'm starting over again. We are not thieves. I work as a cleaner at the school for the council, but we have to eat. Look what I picked up, food for the baby. It's wet, so I don't know if I can use it. People are struggling. In some places, there's no water or electricity and the internet is down. And there's mud everywhere. So it seems pretty clear from that BBC report from this morning that the disaster response in Valencia has been a disaster. And in Jacobin, the Madrid-based writer Owen Gilmartin has elaborated on how mass deaths this week weren't just a result of natural forces. And I caught up with Owen earlier today and began by asking him to lay out what had gone wrong with the response to these floods. I think there's a couple a couple of elements here. Um, one is the immediate management, which has been a disaster. So the the Met, of, Met Office here in Spain issued um, its highest red alert on Tuesday morning, and um, that's the, you know for extreme danger. And um, the the office that that monitors river river levels also issued an important warning about lunchtime. And the regional regional government, which is a right wing government led by the Popular Party, basically ignored it and downplayed these warnings. So what you had was um, people went to work like normal. The universities closed, the schools closed, but um, thousands of people went to work. And in Spain, people tend to finish a little bit later. So the worst the worst flooding, particularly in <clears throat> in the south of of Valencia which is a working class area, um, hit, hit at rush hour. And so thousands of people were leaving work. They were in their cars as, as the, the floodwaters hit. Um, others, others were trapped in their workplaces in Ikea, for example, and, and shopping centers. Horrific, horrific scenes from Ikea in Valencia where you know, people were, they were being pulled out of the, the floodwaters. Um, Spain's largest shopping center, which unfortunately is built on, a, on the floodplains in, in Valencia, uh, was also badly hit. And their work, workers were not allowed to leave either. I mean, the cin cinema was open until the afternoon. And you had a situation where they had asked their bosses to leave. 
they knew this was coming. There was already flooding in parts of the region. Um, the bosses didn't let them go. The actual flood, flood alert, the official flood alert, uh, only came at 8.15. The floodwaters hit at 7.30. So they only received the official flood alert from the regional government after, after most of the, the damage had happened. Um, there are questions, should the national government have stepped in? And I think we can get into that maybe, but it's one of the issues here is that one of the right-wing sort of talking point, points is that the current center-left president or prime minister is, you know, has been trying to sort of infringe on regional powers. And I think probably the national government, which has also been hit by sort of corruption scandals at the moment, is is a little bit wary of 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 being seen to step in to step in and um, take charge. It is it is really up to the regional government to do that as well. They didn't do it. Another of the issues now we're seeing it with the sort of slow arrival of of aid to 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 some of the worst hit areas is that the the regional premier didn't didn't even um, ask ask the army to come in until yesterday afternoon. I mean he waited. He waited un, un, until Thursday, th Thursday to actually do that. So it's, um, it's yeah, it's been a mess. Reading about the the regional premier, so the, from from the popular party or Partido Popular, the sort of centre right or right wing party. I mean, it sounds almost like he's a bit like the mayor from Jaws. Like he he tweeted, didn't he, on Tuesday at noon that the worst would be over by six pm. And as you've just said, sort of the worst happened at, at seven thirty when people were on their way back from work. He didn't declare a, a state of emergency until way after the flooding had hit, and I mean that will have presumably cost lots of lives, right? Listening to the radio, for example, on, on Tuesday evening in in Spain was very tragic. You had people, again, work, work, workers caught on the roofs of warehouses. They had gone in for the evening shift. I mean, you know, they should not have gone into work for for the evening shift. Um, but it's it's not just the, the immediate management of this. It's also a sort of litany of climate skeptic policies, which which added to the disaster. Um, he formed a coalition with the extreme right Vox in 2023, and one of one of their conditions for um, for jo for joining government was the elimination of um, the emergent emergency response unit, the the regional emergency response unit. They also slashed funding to deal with climate change, uh, also the budget for dealing with forest fires, another big issue, climate related issue here. And so you have a premier who, who's, you know, is, I guess his policy, his more immediate policies would be, where medium term policies would be quite climate skeptic. And then at the same time, yeah, he, he repeatedly downplayed this. He didn't seem to want, yeah, shops to close. Um, or you know, workplaces to close, and obviously, yeah, it's 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 a very tragic thing where it's it's still unclear how many people have died. The official death toll is over two hundred, but again, the slow response of of trying to get to some of the worst hit areas means there's reports of bodies still in cars, still in you know, in in houses, etc. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's big big questions being been asked here. I mean, this is this is a big problem. Could you talk about the rescue effort? So, from the images I've seen, it seems like you know there's a whole city sort of coated in 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 mud, um, and obviously you know lots of buildings will, will have been destroyed by by water. I mean, the, the images that people will have seen of cars piled up just seems fairly dystopian. I mean, where where are we at this point with, with the recovery effort? We've seen incredible images this morning of of thousands of just ordinary people walking out of the city, walking out of Valencia to some of the hard hit areas. It was really the sort of periphery of the city, the industrial south, et cetera, and, and villages around, around the city that were the worst hit. And people are walking out with, with supplies, with, um, with brooms, with mops, with shovels, et cetera, to help in the rescue effort. Um, but yeah, I mean, the level of destruction obviously is, is, is massive. You know, images of just thousands of cars, the floodwaters, to, um, you know, haven't completely receded in some areas, and there is now a lot of criticism that maybe the national government should step in um, and and try and just take charge of the uh, crisis management. Um, at the same time, we're unfortunately seeing, which is probably inevitable, uh, you know, um, sort of fake fake news swirling around on on social media. The 
the far right are blaming sort of ecological policies and uh, and let the current centre left government for supposedly removing hundreds of um, dams that were built by um, the dictator Francisco Franco. Supposedly they were meant to have, would would have saved um, the city from 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 this destruction. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I think there is a certain frustration now at the, at the slow, s- slowness of the response. Again, the regional premier is coming in for criticism there because, for example, the fire brigade in the city hasn't been fully deployed to some of these uh, areas in the outskirts. And there's, you know, reports. I saw one interview on on Spanish TV with a a, a fireman saying basically, "Look, I'm I'm here on my day off. I'm ready to work, but they I haven't been called called up." So. There is again, yeah, it's, it's this sort of really laissez-faire right-wing attitude, both both to um, cl- climate cr- crisis and now to this this uh, response to the to the emergency. That was Owen Gill Martin speaking to me earlier today. An increase in borrowing announced in Rachel Reeves' budget has led to a flurry of headlines about market panic. The Financial Times led the paper today with the news that borrowing costs had ticked up as investors digested Reeves' budget debt demands. And The Telegraph warned that markets had turned on Rachel Reeves over the increase to the tax burden. And on Sky News this morning, the shadow Treasury Minister, Gareth Davies, tried to stick the boot in. The good thing about market reaction is that there's no politics in it. They are looking at the hard facts. They're looking at things like the OBR report, which show that there's going to be no growth, that actually growth is going to be downgraded, that show that debt is going to go up by something like 140 billion, that debt interest payments that are going to go up. They're looking dispassionately at this budget and saying, is this going to be good for growth? Is this going to be good for the UK economy and the British people? And they, yesterday, were selling off government bonds because they felt that this was not the case, which meant that Rachel Reeves unbelievably had to go on the airwaves last night to reassure and stabilise markets. That's an incredibly humiliating thing for a Chancellor to have to do. Really? It has gone from four to four and a half percent. It's a noticeable rise, but it's been orderly. You ask any anybody working I, in the markets. I understand the markets. They will. Uh, t- I know well, you do. You, you want to make this comparison, given to what happened in 2022. I am not the one making the comparison. All the newspapers this morning are comparing it to the mini budget. Now, of course, Labour fought their election campaign on the basis that they would never do something like Liz Truss's mini budget. So if Davis's comparison there stuck, it would be very damaging. But the comparison doesn't really work. After Rachel Reeves' budget, borrowing costs went up from 4.2% to 4.46%. That move in the cost of borrowing is less than a tenth of the size of what happened after Liz Truss's mini budget. Um, Aaron Bastani, welcome to the show. Um, What's your thoughts on these headlines we've seen? The pounds falling, borrowing costs are going up. It seems a little bit like a storm in a teacup to me. Well, there's a lot going on, Michael. Uh, There's a lot of cope. There's a lot of cope going on. There were posts yesterday from Tory councillors and outriders and influencers and politicians and Shushan boys saying, it's over. Labour have collapsed the economy. And I was looking at the pound to dollar exchange rate, one to 1.9, um, or one to 1.19, uh, higher than it's been for most of this year. Pretty reasonable. Actually, if you look over the last five years, pretty good. Same with the euro. Yep, 10 year gilts edged up slightly, but they were starting from a higher baseline than they were in 2022. And actually, like you say, the movement itself isn't significant. So, of course, that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, you don't want a run on your currency. You don't want your bond yields to massively increase because, of course, the cost of borrowing then goes up. Those are serious things that can happen, by the way, but they weren't happening. And I, I, I think there's a lot of cope right now coming out from the right. Why? Firstly, yes, when trust was defenestrated by the Bank of England and Andrew Bailey, I think that was partly political, frankly. They didn't like what she was doing when she was doing it, and they didn't try to ease the situation, actually. They, they wanted to bring it to a head and basically stop a political program they disagreed with. I, I agree with that analysis so far. They are upset that the IMF, the BOE, Andrew Bailey, the financial press aren't doing the same now with Rachel Reeves. Why isn't the same happening? Well, first of all, the macroeconomic factors are very different. Inflation, I think, uh, the last time I've asking was 1.7%. 
Uh, interest rates have had a cut. They're probably going to have another cut quite soon, probably another cut early next year. Uh, you saw growth expectations for this year upgraded recently. So you've actually got a pretty nice set of circumstances which allowed Rachel Reeves to be a bit more ambitious than she probably would have been. Uh, it's a huge increase in tax take. You've had a reconfiguration of the rules by which we judge the deficit. Um, of course, those have been changed so that investment in capital expenditure, capital infrastructure, etc., is accounted for slightly differently. Uh, those are major shifts, major changes. And I can understand to an extent why the right look at that and say, well, hold on. Rachel Reeves isn't uh, being punished for thinking and acting big. And yet our person, Liz Truss, when she was in the hot seat in 2022, she was punished very sorely, very historically, in fact. So I get that to an extent. But like I say, the macroeconomic factors are very different. We're not in the middle of a massive cost of living crisis. We're not in the middle of a massive global energy price spike. Inflation is lower. Rates are lower. It's a bit more calm. If anything, growth expectations for the UK this year are slightly better than they were. So it is just very different. And I think there's an element of people like Guido Fawkes and so on, these right-wing influencers, trying to wish this into reality. They're trying to catalyze, because of course, you know, animal spirits and market sentiment go hand in hand. They're trying to catalyze a sense of panic, but there isn't, right? Pound to dollar, pound to euro, 10-year gills. There, there just isn't, okay? You can do the little snapshots. They'll do a snapshot from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., Oh, it's fallen. It looks, oh my God, this is awful. Yeah, it's, it's gone down by 0.1%. Okay, fine. That looks awful. Now do six months, do five years. It's fine. Chill out. Um, with mainstream media journalists instead, and many of the papers, they want clicks. They want attention. And this constant sense, this zeitgeist of panic, anxiety, gets your attention. Sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes it isn't. In this instance, I don't think it is. I agree with you on that one. Everyone needs to chill out a bit. Uh, you, you've talked about sort of the attacks from the right over the past couple of days. There's, of course, been criticisms from the left of Wednesday's budget. And there seems to be one critique of the budget that has appeared more than any other um, from the left, as I say, and it concerns capital gains tax. This was the statement from the progressive think tank, the IPPR. And the budget's tax reforms have prevented the worst of the planned spending cuts that were inherited from the previous government, but there is more work to do. A wealthy millionaire or billionaire will still be able to pay a lower rate of tax than the average nurse, and the overall spending envelope will still leave some departments with tough decisions to make. Um, the New Economics Foundation said this, for too long the income some people get for simply owning things like stocks and shares has been taxed less than the income most of us get from work. Today's changes to capital gains missed the chance to make sure income from work and from wealth are taxed the same. And for good measure, this was James Medway at NavarraMedia.com. Uh, you can read his full uh, analysis of the budget there. Uh, he said this, Labour's pledges, unwillingness to stand up to those lobbying for the wealthy have meant skipping over Big, obvious, widely supported changes like equalizing capital gains tax to income tax, making the tax on income from selling shares or art equal to that on income from paid work. Um, if they're all correct, that put this brag from Rachel Reeves on Wednesday in her budget in a different light. Today, we will increase the lower rate of capital gains tax from 10 to 18 percent and the higher rate from 20 to 24 percent while maintaining the rates of capital gains tax on residential property at 18 and 24% too. This means the UK will still have the lowest capital gains tax rate of any European G7 economy. So she's sort of raising the capital gains tax ever so slightly, but saying, don't worry, don't worry, it's still much lower than everywhere else. So what are the stakes in this argument? Well, I spoke earlier to Pranesh Narayanan from the New Economics Foundation. One of the key issues with capital gains tax is that it is much lower than income tax. So the tax rate on capital gains is much lower than the tax rate on, um, you know, your, your paycheck. And this matters because lots of people at the top of the income distribution, so when we're talking about 0.1%, are able to actually pay lower rates of tax than, you know, a nurse or a teacher um, by effectively uh, making their income through capital gains. There are some good reasons um, for sort of incentivizing people to make capital gains, but I think the, the thing that we're arguing is 
not all capital gains are made on sort of productive economic activity. You can have some people make capital gains by, you know, starting up and growing a company that's really solved a problem in the world. So, you know, if someone's d discovered uh, a new way to run um, an energy system and they've got a business off that, that is a good thing. And, um, you know, the capital gains made there are, you know, from productive activity. But you can also make capital gains from just buying and owning assets. So you can, if you're already wealthy, you can buy up um, the huge stocks and shares portfolio. Those stocks and shares can appreciate over time without you doing anything. And you can then sell those on for um, a profit. And that profit is taxed uh, sort of less than, um, you know, an equivalent amount of money made through work. So ultimately, there is this point of uh, sort of unfairness, um, but also the system incentivizes certain sort of activities that aren't necessarily productive. So it isn't all that productive if you just buy and sell shares on the stock market, for example. It is productive if you set up a business and grow it. Um, and so I think the issue here is how do you make sure that you apply a fair tax rate to sort of ordinary or passive income from, from wealth um, whilst also maintaining some of those incentives to um, you know, take risks, grow productive businesses? That was Pranesh Narayanan. Um, Aaron, uh, you can talk about capital gains tax, but I also want sort of your big picture um, how do you think this 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 budget has has landed? I'd say sort of forty eight hours in, no one seems too pissed off. I suppose there's some farmers who want to sort of bequeath their farms to to people, but apart from that, um, what's your take? Well, what we, what we do know is, Michael, that Tory voters who've never voted Labour before will absolutely not be voting Labour at the next general election. Uh, if you look on Twitter, you can be damn sure of that. Uh, and of course, Tory MPs are adamant that this is a complete failure. If you look at the polling on this, the one issue that actually the public is kind of upset about is bus fares. That's the one policy they do not like. They do not want to see that cap on bus fares go from two to three pounds. They want, broadly speaking, higher taxes to fund the NHS. That is literally the mandate upon which Labour was elected. And I think Labour in this budget have been laser focused on, on two things. One, they've tried to generate as much money as I think politically feasible. To direct towards the NHS. Of course, more money doesn't always mean better outcomes, but it's, it's necessary. It's certainly a prerequisite. Two, I think there is definitely the impetus to try and run a budget surplus between now and the next general election. Why? Because, and by the way, I don't support, you don't need to run surpluses. I'm not Angela Merkel, okay? Why does Rachel Reeves want to do it? Well, firstly, they need to assure markets that they're not being spendthrifts, that they can pay their debt, we can pay our debt. Um, and they want the, um, those 10-year gilts to go down. They want the interest that we pay on our public debt to stabilize or to go down. They certainly don't want it to go up. Why is that? Well, in 2019, about 5% of overall government spending was servicing our public debt. Um, today, it's around 10%. So 10% of the entire government spend is servicing the interest on the total national debt, which I think last year was something like 114 billion pounds. A lot of money. Right, um, it's a lot more than defence. Uh, I think it's about the same as defence and policing put together. It's about the same as education. A lot of money, and I think for Reeves and for people around her, if we can get close to running a surplus, which by the way this country has only done five times since 1970-71, right? The, the political class in 2010 was pretending we always do it, spend thrift labour. No, it's very unusual. It's actually very unusual post Second World War, but particularly unusual post 70-71. Only five times. Right, I think two of those were under New Labour, one under Lawson in the late 80s, uh, and then a few others. But those are the last three. Right, so they're not recent. There's three in the last 30 years. And if you run a surplus, you're going to give people buying government debt a bit more confidence. You're going to win that that mantle of um, economic uh, competence, trust from the markets, from the financial bigwigs. It's going to be very hard for someone like George Osborne, Tory pundits, to say that she's a spender if she doesn't know what she's doing, when she's run a surplus. And the last time the Conservative Party ran a surplus, ran a surplus in office was in the late 1980s. Um, on top of that, 
what it will mean is that Labour, I think, I suspect, if the plan works out, will probably deliver some tax cuts in the budget before the next general election. And they'll be able to say, we can afford those tax cuts. They'll probably be tiny, by the way. We can afford those tax cuts for working people because we've been sensible with the budget. We run a surplus. We fix the NHS. And let's be honest, that is living up primarily to the, to the big two promises they made at the general election. We will be sensible administrators with the economy. We won't see a rerun of Liz Truss and we will fix the NHS. And I think if they do those two things, they're more than likely uh, to be re-elected. So they're laser focused on those, on those two things. And that's why this week we had this almighty budget. It was a huge budget in terms of generating taxes. They wanted to get this done early. Like I said, it fund the NHS and to move away from this deficit we've got and certainly to press it down, if not to run a, to run a surplus. The only thing that I'm really upset about, Michael, is, is the buses. Uh, I think it's a real shame. It doesn't raise that much money. Uh, it's hugely useful to working people. Uh, if you look at, I think, the bottom fifth of income earners in this country, households, more than 50% of them don't have a car. So people that are really struggling benefited materially from that policy. Uh, it was working. You talk to anybody in local government, they will tell you more people were using buses as a result of this policy. And of course, everybody says we want to reduce social isolation. We want to increase um, uptake of public transport. We want to reduce CO2 emissions. This should be a gimme policy. It's high return on investment on all three counts. They got rid of it. I'll never know why. As I said a few moments ago, that was the least popular part of the entire budget. Uh, I'll finish with this. If this budget had been implemented by McDonnell and Corbyn, if John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn had changed the rules around deficit funding for capital expenditure, and if they had increased taxes on the wealthy and on businesses, like Rachel Reeves has just done, there would have been a far, far more aggressive and violent reaction from the markets. Now, I don't like that world. I don't want to live in that world where the markets can constrain politicians like that. But as somebody on the left, that's a really important lesson. Vibes matter. Vibes matter. Because there's a big, big gulf between what Labour have just done, which is actually quite radical, and the reaction from the markets. Why is that? Well, it's because Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer have basically not talked about any of this for a very long time. And they've really underplayed the radicalism of certain aspects of their program. And I think that's quite impressive, frankly. Sometimes there is very little upside to telling everybody how radical you are. Calm things down. Don't necessarily talk about it. Talk about it to your base. Get them excited. Uh, but you don't need to project it to the whole country and certainly not to the bond markets. And then when you're in power, deliver. It's really interesting. Let's see if it works out. And we'll know if it's worked out three, four years from now. God, I like this. Let's calm things down. The, the Friday night show is like Valium today. On this show, I don't want to just talk about the fears people rightly have about climate change, but also the potential for solutions. And when it comes to solutions, um, I think new technologies absolutely need to play a massive role. I'm not someone who's sort of skeptical about technical fixes. I think probably they're going to have a massive role. I mean, they already are, aren't they? A new development, though, taking place in Silicon Valley is proving controversial, to say the least. Um, according to Bloomberg, to limit the effects of global warming, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are pouring money into blocking out the sun. The new technologies Bloomberg are talking about here relate to solar radiation management, which aims to increase the amount of energy from the sun reflected back into space instead of entering and staying within the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this can be done via two main methods. One of them is called stratospheric aerosol injection that involves releasing particles high up in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight. So it's sort of the, these aerosol particles, which means that literally the sun isn't getting through or you know, less of the sun is getting through. That will cool down the atmosphere. The other is called marine cloud brightening. Um, this involves spraying salt water much lower in the atmosphere to brighten clouds so they are capable of reflecting more of the sun's radiation. Now, from a gut perspective, I always find that sort of Cloud brightening to me sounds nicer uh, than putting sulfur dioxide up at the top of the atmosphere, but that's not a scientific uh, perspective. That's just when I'm flying in a plane, I like to see those clouds and I think they could always be a bit brighter. Um, let's look at how this process has been described 
by Bloomberg in this article. So this is their graphic sort of explaining how it's done, how to block the sun and cool the planet. Um, and this is uh, the method which involves aerosols very high in the stratosphere. It will require a flying special aircraft 24 hours, seven days a week for 365 days a year, so all the time. Um, and it's got these uh, free phases, um, stratospheric aerosol injection, lofters or sails release several million tons of sulfur dioxide a year. And you can see here, this is in the stratosphere, so much higher than a normal commercial jet would fly. Um, those aerosols then reflect a small proportion of solar radiation. Um, and the fleet of planes rotates continuously, deploying SO2, that sulfur dioxide, the amount released, coupled with greenhouse gas emissions cuts, determine how much the planet cools. Now, we know this works sort of technically, right? Because this is what happens when volcanoes erupt. So there are periods that we can sort of see in the geological record where a volcano has erupted and then the world has cooled for a couple of years afterwards because so many aerosols have gone into the stratosphere. This would basically be recreating that. Um, we also know it would work because actually we've been doing the opposite for a little while. Um, quite rightly, uh, we have been trying to limit the number of aerosols which are produced because they are polluting. Um, and that means that more of the sun is getting through, which has had, you know, potentially a, a bit of effect um, in terms of making climate change worse. The fact that we have put up some of those polluting aerosols actually uh, is giving us a bit more time than it would have done otherwise. So this is just saying, let's do it intentionally. Um, as you can probably gather, I think there's an obvious logic to deploying this kind of technology. Of course, it shouldn't stop us in our rush to net zero. It's not a long-term solution to climate change because you have to keep doing it permanently. Um, and you can also have a, you know, if you stop for whatever reason, climate change comes back with a bang. Um, so this is not a long-term solution, but given that dangerous climate change is already here and given net zero will inevitably take decades to achieve, using some form of solar radiation management in the meantime seems sensible. However, whether we want tech founders and investors to be taking the lead here is a very different question. Um, Bloomberg report this. Many tech types turn to science fiction for inspiration. And in the case of geoengineering, there's a template, Neil Stevenson's 2021 novel, Termination Shock. The plot follows a Texas billionaire who takes climate matters into his own hands by building the world's biggest gun to shoot particles into the sky to reflect incoming sunlight. Now, of course, Elon Musk having moved to Texas means that it's quite easy to sort of put a face to that fictional character. Um, they say most SRMs, so that's solar radiation management research, focuses on planes delivering sulfur dioxide to the stratosphere. At least one startup is already iterating on that concept. Luke Iceman started Make Sunsets after reading Termination Shock, so this speculative fiction novel. The startup is already launching sulfate-filled balloons and sells cooling credits akin to carbon offsets. It's impossible to measure exactly what impact, if any, Make Sunsets has on the planet's temperature. So Make Sunsets is saying, you know, we're not wasting any time. We're, we're putting balloons into the atmosphere filled with sulfur, and then we're just going to do it off our own back, uh, cool down the planet. Now, Make Sunsets, it should be stressed, is definitely at the extreme end here. And the company only has $1 million in funding. So it's nothing when we're talking about uh, the money floating around in Silicon Valley. But much bigger money is going into less madcap projects and especially into basic research when it comes to geoengineering. And this is from Bloomberg again. Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates was one of the first billionaires to back scientists studying the topic more than a decade ago. Last year, OpenAI chief executive Officer Sam Altman expressed support for SRM research in Silicon Valley abounds with speculation on whether he's spending some of his AI fortune on it. A cohort of benefactors with ties to meta platforms, um, such so as Facebook, including former technology chief Mike Schroffer, co-founder Dustin Moskowitz, and former executive and current venture capitalist Matt Kohler have placed bets on blocking the sun. So too have lowercase capital founder Chris Sacker and hotel heiress turned Bay Area philanthropist Rachel Pritzker. And they say, while most of the new interest comes from the tech world, some in finance have also started investing in geoengineering research. A recent $40 million commitment from the Quadrature Climate Foundation, a UK-based nonprofit tied to an investment company of the same name, is roughly on par with the US government's entire funding for the field to date. 
And they say the Simons Foundation, which is a New York-based philanthropy backed by late hedge fund billionaire Jim Simons, recently committed $50 million to SRM research. So we've got lots of private investors saying this is something we want to make a bet on. So how should we respond to the knowledge that the very wealthy are leaning into geoengineering, literally changing the weather. Well, one person who thinks geoengineering should be taken seriously, but probably not left to billionaires, is Holly Jean Buck. Um, Holly Jean Buck is an associate professor in environment and sustainability at the University of Buffalo, and she's author of After Geoengineering, Climate Tragedy Repair and Restoration, published by Verso. Um, I spoke to Holly earlier today, and I began by asking her why geoengineering proves so controversial. There's just a very basic common sense reaction that most people have that's like, we don't know what the unintended consequences would be and humans don't have a great track record when it comes to large scale interventions. It's a common concern because it's so sensible. Um, And I think it's true. And I think we already do have large scale modifications if you think about fertilizer production and the nitrogen cycle. And that has caused really bad ecosystem effects, but also allows billions of people to eat. So I think we have to kind of take stock about all the set of interactions we're having and continue to figure out how to ameliorate the bad impacts and make things better. I'm somewhat surprised as to why we aren't seeing sort of more buzz around geoengineering. I mean, because sort of, as I said earlier, you know, we're already seeing the effects of climate change. And I saw, I, I suppose some of my, again, this is somewhat controversial sometimes when I say, I, I think when it comes to emissions reductions, we are moving somewhat in the right direction, just not nearly fast enough when it comes to the the potentially catastrophic events we we are facing. Um, and so sort of geoengineering as a, as a means of sort of, I suppose, smoothing the transition. We don't want this as a long-term solution, but if it's a sort of short-term bridging um, sort of mechanism we can use while we get to net zero, that seems sensible. Um, So on that side, it seems like, why aren't people looking at this? There's also, I mean, and this is the reason why people don't like geoengineering, uh, or lots of people don't like geoengineering, is because big business, the fossil fuel industry can say, well, if we get geoengineering right, we don't even have to go to net zero anyway. So we can basically just do what we were sort of doing before, and have these planes flying in the stratosphere, um, pumping out sulfur and continue as, as usual. Now, both of those things to me would suggest that a lot of money would be going into this. Bloomberg is saying some money is going into this, but as you're saying, this is not sort of a massive thing which, which governments are jumping on. Yeah, if you think from the perspective of an elected official, there's absolutely nothing to be gained by um, activating people on this because you have people on on the left that are more environmental that are exactly concerned about what you just said, perpetuation of fossil fuels, and they're skeptical and against this. And you also have people on the right who don't believe in climate change, but may think that climate change is an excuse for a global elite to impose different measures. And they're also very much against this idea of more government interference in the weather. So you would mobilize to vocal constituencies against you and who would really be supporting you. <laughs> Is that an argument for innovators in Silicon Valley who are sort of, you know, they're, they're a very sort of unique subset of society in a way where they're quite sort of pro science. So, uh, you know, I, I think most people in Silicon Valley believe that climate change is a big problem. They're also massively into tech solutions in a way that's sort of quite different from the environmental movement. So, have you just given an arg- an argument as to why actually maybe we should read this Bloomberg article and think there's no interest for governments to do this? So thank God there are some sort of thoughtful entrepreneurs going ahead and doing it themselves. Well, the other thing is that you really wouldn't want critical infrastructure in the hands of billionaires because then, then what happens, right? I think you can maybe look at Space or Starlink as an example where now you have a lot of people really dependent on um, one whimsical right-wing billionaire for their in- internet infrastructure. And do we want to repeat that with the climate? No. So I-, I still think we really need to make a political demand for public funding for this research and better oversight, regulation, governance, all of that. Is that the main thing sort of you're arguing for in your work, which is to say, let's have more government public funding 
um, of um, looking at sort of solar radiation management, looking at cloud seeding, cloud brightening. Um, uh, or I suppose the, the regulation side to me seems a bit more complex than the sort of funding of research side. What, or could you talk in a bit more detail about sort of what you think people should be demanding when it comes to um, geoengineering, let's say? Yeah, I think governance of research and governance of deployment are linked. I think the proposals for having um, a moratorium on deployment at the moment until more research is done are sensible. But I'm most concerned with research governance. So we need a program that is transparent, that is holistic, making sure you're looking systematically at all the things that could go wrong, that's interdisciplinary, and that is competitive and international. So right now, that's not the status quo we have. We have well-connected people at elite institutions getting funded because they have personal relationships or connections with billionaires. And we're missing a public con conversation about how that research should go, what questions it should be addressing. Um, so that's where my focus is right now. I suppose some people are worried that if these tech billionaires sort of go ahead and do it themselves, that could cause the kind of public backlash that would make the I suppose, mature public conversation you're talking about even more difficult to have. Is that a concern you share? I think that's absolutely the case. I think we have empirical evidence about that now. I mean, we've been doing research and people want universities to be the ones researching this. They're skeptical about government. They're much more skeptical about the private sector researching it. And they really hate figures like Bill Gates. It elicits a reaction for people rightly or wrongly, about the image they have in their mind about elites trying to control everything. Is there a problem then, as far as I understand it, there are sort of, sort of very esteemed scientists, I think David Keefe comes to mind, where their sort of university managed um, deployment or not deployment, sort of research into geoengineering has been stymied, I think, by um, opposition, I suppose the kind of opposition you were talking about there, um, that, you know, why governments might not be so interested in doing this. I, is it a problem that academics at major research universities are being stopped from um, researching properly these methods? I mean, yes and no. That was a complicated case with this Harvard backed experiment. Um, but there's been a lot of writing about it. They had a governance committee, um, but some of the public engagement wasn't done. So I think these early cases highlight how important it is for universities to do things in a certain way. They can't just do whatever they want. You know, we have best practices about engagement. Um, and I think that it, is, but it is a problem. I mean, we do need more research. And if you're like a young person, do you want to research this? Is it going to make risks to your career? Um, th these sorts of questions are real. That was Holly Jean Buck speaking to me earlier today. Aaron Bastani, I'm desperate for your thoughts on geoengineering. It's nuts. We don't need to do it. Really? Why do you think we don't need to do it? it well, we need to clearly make, um, or we really need to take rather, decisive action with regards to this problem and, and drawing down levels of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but particularly CO2, methane as well. We need to reduce those, obviously, uh, so that we don't have higher temperatures. We're already one degree warmer uh, than we were in the, the mid-19th century. And of course, I think we're, we're headed for more than two degrees. And simply by virtue of what we've already done, simply by virtue of the present atmospheric concentrations of CO2, it will rise higher still. Even if we stopped all CO2 emissions tomorrow, we would still see some uh, rise in global temperatures. Now, that needs to be addressed. Where I am very... Um, circumspect about this stuff, Michael, is that we have that we know what to do about this. We know. We know what to do, right? We know what we know exactly what to do. There is a bunch of quote unquote technology which helps us reduce concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Trees. If McKinsey uh, could discover something which was effectively free uh, and reduced CO2 and increased biodiversity, they would be all over it. But the point is, trees don't make many people money, or at least. They can if you talk about um, quote-unquote nature-based solutions and you try and um, uh, create certain debt uh, instruments around planting trees. By the way, that often doesn't work because they're monocultures. It's actually not the kind of trees that you want, et cetera, et cetera. But 
broadly speaking, we need more things that absorb CO2. Another one is whales. We don't talk about this nearly enough. There was a report out a few years ago that basically said the monetary value of a whale, the average whale, I know you get all kinds of whales, minky whale, sperm whale, blue whale, the average whale is worth about $2 million in terms of their ability to sequester carbon. The average whale absorbs around a thousand times more carbon than the average tree. Now, obviously, because of how we've um, engaged with the oceans, uh, particularly really in the last century, but over obviously multiple millennium, but particularly in the last century, century and a half, there are far fewer whales in the ocean today uh, than there have ever been. I mean, certain populations have gone up, to be fair, in some places, but they're very, very low, certainly by historic standards. And these should be rightly viewed as pieces of um, carbon sequestration infrastructure. It exists, right? So more whales, more trees, more rewilding uh, would allow us to reduce levels of CO2. The point is, some people don't want to do that, Michael, because it doesn't make them money. Okay, so if we can create a new process which we can patent and it's going to be gee whiz, tech, gizmo, bullshit, then let's do it. And I think a good analogy here is um, Hyperloop and The Loop. Do you remember The Loop, Michael, in um, in um, Las Vegas? Do you remember that? I'm not sure if I remember The Loop. The Loop. It's basically a tunnel, right, for cars. Um, and Elon Musk talks about the Hyperloop as well. Basically, Elon Musk, 10 years ago, it was all over these new kinds of transportation solutions. Aren't they incredible? One of them, like I said, was called The Loop. It was basically a tunnel for cars underground, right? We solved the issue of high-speed transport in cities. We solved that problem 150 years ago with underground trains. It was solved, right? You don't need to innovate. Make it cheaper. Make it more effective. You can add uh, air conditioning. Great. Make it safer. Fantastic. But we, we basically fixed that. You don't need to create a new thing. Same with Hyperloop. When you actually talk to rail engineers and you look at the details, you look at the numbers, Hyperloop was never, ever, ever going to work. And one of the reasons why the media loved to talk about Hyperloop several years ago is because the hollowing out of the media means we no longer have transport correspondents. Instead, we have technology correspondents. So everything becomes a tech story. Have you noticed that? Everything becomes a tech story. Uh, if there are people protesting on the street, um, people aren't talking necessarily just about the, the grievances they have. It's all, there's also a tech angle. They're using tech. They're using social media. They're using phones. Everything becomes a tech story because of the f uh, one of the few areas that journalism has invested in, media outlets have invested in over the last 15 years, has been technology. So technology reporting. So you do have this inbuilt bias now to look at things as tech. There's a tech solution here. We don't need a tech solution to this. We have, we have the technology for this. So like I say, with regards to high-speed, efficient, effective transit in large cities, we solved that a century and a half ago. We don't need loop. We don't I need think you are... Loop. I think you are kind of radically understating sort of the, the challenge of climate change. The idea that if we just plant a few more trees and no, 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 let no, a few no. more whales live, then we're, we're no, going to no, be no, fine. No, I mean, actually. all the trajectories from the UN and everything is that we're going to miss the yeah. 1.5 degree target. And the, the, the worries from experts is that what we could have is some sort of tipping point whereby the Arctic collapses. You know, the former um, chief scientific um, advisor, uh, for the UK, Sir David King, he talks about this all the time. He says he wants some cloud brightening basically above the Arctic so that we can stop those tipping points taking place because he recognizes we're, we're already quite close to that tipping point. So the idea is cloud, to say we don't need it, we'll just plant some no, trees. No, cloud brightening. We'll, no, we'll no, look, look. promote the, the sort of production of whales. It seems, seems a bit far, it seems a bit complacent to me, let's say. It's not complacent. No, no, Michael, we know exactly what we have to do. The point is, here's the caveat, all the stuff you're talking about, I'm being complacent. No, I'm, I'm being literally honest. These wacky solutions are being thrown out there because basically these people think that we can have perennial global GDP growth forever of 3%, right? If you think that, then yes, you absolutely need some Hail Mary nut job solution. You absolutely need that, which by the way, probably won't work. He talks about termination shock. I mean, the problem with termination shock, the book is, if you read it, it's a very interesting book, good book. Problem is, once you start these solutions, you can't stop them. The minute you well, stop them, that's why it has to be transitionary, right? I mean, that's what David King is is saying. He's saying what we want to do is we want to um, protect the Arctic with cloud brightening while we get down to net zero. And I mean, the idea that you, 
I agree. We wouldn't need tech solutions if we could just click our fingers and radically change politics everywhere and just say, oh, by the way, China, no, by no, the way, I'm India, saying, you don't really need to grow. I'm saying that, Michael. We, we hope that someone can get elected in a liberal democracy while saying that your consumption might fall a little bit. And by the way, we're going to turn everything into a forest, right? Politics is you're often a problem confused. which is just no, as difficult to, to fix as technology. You're getting confused here. You're making the claim that liberal democracies possibly can't address the climate crisis. I agree with you, by the way. I think they probably can't. Okay. Uh, that's a separate argument to saying that we have to have well, not a separate, deal. It's not a separate argument because the, the point is, if you're saying the politics because, are as they are, and well, what they're not, we... They're not, are well, they? Well, well, so you're saying they're liberal not, democracies aren't going to be able to deal with the climate crisis. Talk at a time if, like if, we're, if we're saying either mm. what we can do is overthrow liberal democracy and implement a completely new political system, or we can try and tinker with uh, the, the levels of um, sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, I would say I feel less like we're all going to die if we put our hopes on some aerosols in the stratosphere. If we say, let's have well, a radically different political system. We're not all going to die, first of all, Michael. I think that's the kind of hysteria that I don't really find particularly useful. We are going to die, but not because of climate change. This has been a very good time to be alive, okay? The problem is, in terms of what we're, what we're storing up for future generations, that will be very difficult and challenging for them in 100, 150, 200 years' time. And that's why we have a responsibility to do something about this. You're saying that liberal... This, this is now... Let's interrogate your argument here. You're saying because liberal democracies... And I, I think I'm probably inclined to agree with this. Because liberal democracies are incapable of addressing the climate crisis, we have to do this stuff. That's what you're saying. Well, which I get yeah, that. I mean, that's, that's one argument for it. Yeah, I think that's a, a that's good, good argument, argument for it. Yeah, I think even so if, if we, we suddenly, have, I think even if everyone was the Chinese Communist Party, we'd still struggle. But I do think that given the fact that we have liberal democracies and also everyone in the developing world wants to develop, people, whoever is governing them, don't tend to sort of like being told um, everything's energy is going to get much more expensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, we're going to turn everything into a forest. Then having a, a technological turn fix, everything into which a gives us the, the well, you said that we don't need to worry about climate change because we just we've got we've got all what we need already, which is forests and whales. You can't let me formulate a, you can't let me formulate the argument because you're perennially interrupting me. Go Seventy on, percent of the planet's surface is ocean. Seventy percent, Michael. We mm -hmm. we have a pretty good understanding that actually more carbon is sequestered by algae floating on water than by the world's forests, woods, and trees. Right. So you could say, for instance, and this is an argument that is barely ever made. Maybe as a species, we make the compact that we stop eating fish. We stop engaging with, you know, the, the, that 70% of the planet's surface, as we have done for the entirety of our species, but particularly in the last century and a half. 70% of the planet's surface. I'm not saying, oh yeah, plant some trees. That would make a huge, huge difference. But instead of saying, okay, shall we fundamentally rethink about how we engage with 70% of the planet's surface, we have a really stupid debate, particularly in the West, about, oh, well, what are we going to do about aviation? By the way, aviation is 3% of all planetary CO2 emissions. doesn't matter. You can decarbonize aviation tomorrow, which, by the way, ain't going to happen. There's still the other 97%. So I actually think you've got it the wrong way around because you're not familiar enough with the literature about, actually, we could do some stuff which politically is quite low-hanging fruit. Yeah, I kind of like fish and chips, but you know what? That is not that politically low-hanging fruit. That is not political. Have you, have you ever seen what happens when a, a politician dares to suggest any kind of tax on meat, right? They will not win an election. It will be no one will even go close to it. This idea that we don't need geoengineering, we'll just ban eating fish. There is, there is not a single government in the no, world, however authoritarian, that would even go close to it. that. Well, you you yeah, but taxing, you taxing is going to be completely impossible as well. There, there is no, the there is no, if I think we're going to, yeah, but fish and, fish and cigarettes a, are very different, right? Because no, with cigarettes, it's a damage to your own health. What's wrong with you tonight? You want to let me make an argument? We have Peruvian taxes all over the place. I'm saying have a Peruvian tax on fish. Yes. Perfectly so you sensible. Think, you, you think Labour should go into the next general election promising that they're going to tax fish? I'm saying to you, over the last 25 years, we have had a climate movement which has talked about things like carbon footprint, aviation, bullshit, when, like I say, 70% of the planet's surface is oceans, we should have a Beguvian tax on meat that comes out of the sea. Yes, we should have that. Far more important to have that than a tax on sugar or, or land mammals. Yes. We should also have rewilding. There's plenty of land in this country which is incapable of being built upon and is incapable, incapable of being used as agricultural land. That land should be rewilded. Not only would it no longer be emitting CO2 emissions, as is the case, for instance, with three million um, acres of grouse moors in England and Scotland, it would actually be absorbing CO2. This is incredibly low-hanging fruit. There is so much of it. 
You don't know about it. Many people don't know about it because the tenor and the tone and the content of the climate conversation has been built on a profound illiteracy actually peddled by big oil. Do you know who came up with the idea of a, of a, of a personal climate footprint which you could calculate? It was BP and Shell. And that's what I'm saying. We need to be thinking about systemic solutions to this. And of course, yes, a mad, untried solution would be some form of geoengineering. And by the way, I'm talking about geoengineering. It's geoengineering with techniques and processes which we know work. You're talking about ones which we have no idea about with regards to long-term consequences. So sure, we should be build, you know, building buildings and painting them all you know, white on top. There are also things you can do, for instance, with the Arctic Circle, which would be quite effective in terms so, of trying to maximize I, I, I'm going to act. interrupt you now just because there's an inconsistency here, which is you keep saying it's low-hanging fruit. All we need to do is have a Bogovian tax on fish. Then I said to you, oh, so should Labour have Rewilding. in their next manifesto taxing fish? And you've said no. Now, if it were low-hanging fruit, if it were politically easy, then surely you would think they should do it. But it's not low-hanging. It, it's incredibly politically different. Difficult, sorry. If, well, if, one if, parliamentary if it's a political cycle, of course fix, it is. Yeah, I'm talking about over 10, 15 years. Well, if we're talking about over 10, 15 years, we actually need very, very urgent action when what, it comes what, to climate change. Is, is geoengineering going to be in the next Labour manifesto? No, but geoengineering, you don't need public so why are you throwing support that for. That's the whole point. Why, no, because, no, why are you no, throwing that, that at me? That's why I'm throwing you that argument. You're playing because, by different rules. No, no, I'm not, right? You don't have to put geoengineering in a manifesto, right? So, you don't, point you is, don't, so it's completely undemocratic? Yeah. Yeah. It, this is not something that you do sort of democratically. You do it via okay. oh, technocracy. You're being honest. You okay, also good. don't do it via Silicon Valley. But, but you don't have it's to say, this is not going to affect you. Sorry if we fuck so, up the planet, everybody. So, so if, you say, if, if you say we're going to put a Pagoovian tax on fish, right, then at the next general election, then Over you're going to get I think destroyed, argument, yeah. right? If you say what we're going to do is we're going to do some cloud brightening over the Arctic, that is not going to lose you a general election. If you say what we're going to do is we're going to invest in putting as much sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere as would be created by a volcano which erupted 20 years ago and gave us a couple of years off of climate change, that is not going to lose you a general election. If you say what I'm going to do is put a 50% a tax on fish, that will, right? Well, you so know what? If we take political constraints seriously, then what you're saying is nonsense. Well, but you're not. No, that, I not. mean, why not? Rewilding is really popular. That's low, like I said, it's low hanging fruit. There is, well, like I said, three. Rewilding maybe is low hanging fruit, but then you said we're going to tax fish, which is not low hanging that's fruit. One, that's one thing of literally hundreds of things we could do. One thing of hundreds of things we could do, from building nuclear generators to uh, retrofitting homes to, like I say, yes, rewilding, banning pesticides in urban areas like in Canada and France. There's literally hundreds of things we can do. And you're saying that undemocratically, without any real kind of political scrutiny or accountability, we should be doing things which could be planetarily existential for our species if they go wrong. Climate okay. change already Bowie's is existential for our species. Always mock attacks on eating right? fish. Knock yourself out. Climate change already is existential for our species. And there, I, I don't see why this would have to be particularly dangerous, which is why you do have lots of scientific experts saying, we'll just brighten the clouds a little bit. Right, the the idea that any of the things you're suggesting get us there close enough. How long does it take for a nuclear reactor to be up and running? Right, it, uh, if we're years. saying that tipping points are fifteen years in the next five to ten years potentially, you say, oh, we'll have nuclear reactors in ten to fifteen years. That that is yeah. not going to be quick enough. Well, so so now you're saying it's the, the tipping point is ten to fifteen years. Well, I don't I don't think that's true. I think it easily could be. I mean, if you if you look at what no, the scientists the are saying about AMOC at the moment, right, which is the is sort of related to the jet stream. There are some serious problems which could emerge over the next 10 to 15 years. We're already seeing an increase in flooding. We're already seeing Hold on, an increased said, risk of drought. You said 10 to 15 years. You just said, you said 5 to 10. Now you're saying 10 to 15. The Either point way. is we're looking at, we're, we're, we're going to pass 1.5 degrees. We agree on that, right? Well, well I don't think we, would have to, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have to pass 1.5 degrees if we did okay. some geoengineering. I think we are. T just for well, people we would watching without listening. It. Just for people watching and listening, generally speaking, that, that tipping point is generally regarded as two degrees. So once you go past two degrees, you'll get to three, to four, to five, to six. Why would that be? Once you get to two, you may see the Amazon start to desertify. Once you get to three, methane hydrate in Siberia starts to bubble up. That gets you to four. Methane hydrate from the bottom of the ocean starts to bubble up. That gets you to five. That gets you to six. By the way, if we get to six degrees, nothing with lungs can live, right? It's very possible. But like I say, that tipping point is generally viewed as two degrees, not 1.5 degrees. So yes, we have to act with great urgency, but we have to also act with intelligence. And I don't think the time frame is 5, 10, 15 years. Frankly, we have to do it in, in our lifetime. Absolutely, that has to happen. 
And that's why we not only have to focus on decarbonizing our economies by 2050, we're also going to have to think about carbon sequestration, which is reducing the atmospheric concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Like I say, we know exactly how to do that, right? It's going to require more trees, more greenery, and yes, more animals, which are fundamentally pieces of carbon infrastructure. You're joking about whales. They have literally been quantified by accountants in this field as pieces of infrastructure worth $2 million each. If there was a machine which could absorb as much carbon as a whale, and it was invented by somebody in California and it was patented, I suspect you'd be singing its praises, Michael. But because it's free and it's an animal and you've not obviously entered this mindset, you're mocking it. Well, I, I sort of disagree. The, the, the bit I was mocking was that taxing fish is low-hanging fruit, right? I don't think it is. We are at the close of the final full week before the US presidential election. Um, it's set to be a knife edge election. You already know this. Trump and Harris are neck and neck in the key battleground states. It literally couldn't be closer. Um, the New York Times have uh, Harris on 49 and Trump on 48 in Wisconsin, in Nevada. They're literally neck and neck. In Pennsylvania, Trump is up by less than one. In Michigan, Harris is up by one. In North Carolina, Trump up by one. And in Georgia and Arizona, Trump up. Now, if that were to be the case, Trump would be the president. Um, but those are really, really close uh, figures. Um, if they look close, election projections are even closer. This is from The Economist. So they say, on their projection, Donald Trump wins 51 in 100 times. Kamala Harris wins 48 in 100 times. And their central projection is that in the Electoral College, Trump gets 270 and Kamala Harris gets 268. Now, earlier in the week, they had them both on 269, which would be uh, constitutionally unprecedented. Um, so with the stakes this high, what issue has defined at the past seven days? Well, principally, it's been a debate over who and what is garbage. After a comedian said at a Trump rally that Puerto Rico was an island of garbage, Joe Biden clapped back with this jibe. And just the other day, a speaker at his rally called Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage. Well, let me tell you something. I don't, I, I don't know the Puerto Rican that, that I know or Puerto Rico, where I'm in my home state of Delaware, they're good, decent, honorable people. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of seen as unconscionable, and it's un-American. It's totally contrary to everything we've done, everything we've been. So that was very much evocative of Hillary Clinton calling Trump supporters deplorables. This is the kind of thing you're not supposed to do, but the guy is, you know... There's been mental deterioration, as you know, everyone's been talking about for the past four or so years. Um, and Trump, as you would imagine, has taken full advantage of that slip up. 250 million people are not garbage. I can tell you who the real garbage is, but we won't say that. I think the Democrats have done a very poor job. We're leading in every in every state. Uh, we're leading big and. I think that the comment made by really both of them, because there are really two of them, uh, about being garbage, maybe 250 million people, uh, they shouldn't be talking. That's like deplorable for Hillary. This is the deplorable for Hillary. And uh, I think this is worse, actually. For Joe Biden to make that statement, it's really a disgrace. Unsurprisingly, Kamala Harris has tried to distance herself from Joe Biden's remarks. I strongly disagree with any criticism of people based on who they vote for. It's, you heard my speech last night and continuously throughout my career. Uh, I believe that the work that I do is about representing all the people, whether they support me or not. And as president of the United States, I will be a president for all Americans, whether you vote for me or not. So she doesn't want to be associated with the deplorable garbage comment. Uh, let's look at what's happened even more recently. So Trump has been in Nevada. He's been speaking to Tucker Carlson, offering jobs to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. See, Bobby, I love you looking at health. I want you to take care of the women of this country, the men of this country, and the children of this country. You don't have to worry about anybody else. But the one thing you got to do for me, Bobby, is leave that. Let, leave what's under my feet, the oil and gas, you leave that to me, Bobby, because that's going to, we're going to make so much damn money and it's clean. It's going to make it clean. So RFK Jr. is the vax 
skeptic who he wants to put in charge of children's health. Um, doesn't sound like a great idea. Um, he also found time to fantasize about violence against a political opponent. And I don't blame him for sticking with his daughter, but his daughter is a very dumb individual, very dumb. She's a radical war hawk. Let's put her with a rifle standing there with nine barrels shooting at her, okay? Let's see how she feels about it. You know, when the guns are trained on her face. So he's talking about Liz Cheney having the guns trained on her face. And he's right about her being a war hawk. But Donald Trump likes imagery about violence against his opponents. And it's sort of especially dark, I find, when he's speaking about um, political opponents who are women. Um, Aaron. We are very close to the presidential election. Your predictions? Oh, I think it's a genuine toss of a coin. I think it's a statistical toss of a coin. I think if you toss that coin 100 times, it would be 50-50. That's what pollsters are saying. Um, and I think it's, it's probably true. I mean, it's kind of crazy that it could come down to a few neighborhoods in places like Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, but that's probably where we are. I mean, who knows, right? We talk about these things with such certainty and then you get these crazy results uh, like we got in 2016. But that seems to be where we are. Kamala is picking up. Kamala Harris is picking up white women from what we believe. Trump is picking up more Latinos, more African-Americans. Um, however, you know, there is something strange going, which is going on, which is if you look at the three largest podcasts in the US right now, not politics podcasts, biggest podcasts, they're all basically pro-Trump. He's just done a, a, an interview with the world's biggest podcast show. He's got the support of the world's wealthiest person. He's got the support of, of America's most identifiable journalist, which, which is Tucker Carlson. It's kind of interesting how the radical right has got this really big coalition around it now. You know, very different in 2016. Doesn't mean he's going to win, by the way. But it's a very different kind of coalition in 2016. And I think that probably suggests that if he does get in, he's going to govern in a very different way too. Uh, thank you all for watching. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll be back on Monday.